Hello and welcome to News Now on TV360. I'm Thelma Okoro. The Department of State Services, DSS, says it has uncovered a plot by River State Governor Nyesom Wike to provoke violence and breach peace in Abuja, the nation's capital. A statement released by the DSS says that Wike had secured the services of thugs led by a man identified as Ikenga Imo Ugo Chinyere, who is a personal aide to the Senate President Bukola Saraki. According to the State Security Service, the aim of the plot is to cause mayhem, a complete breakdown of law and order and Kazi security agencies and the federal government in bad light. The DSS also claims that the River State Governor intends to divert public and international attention from the ongoing police investigation into his role in the violence that trailed the rerun election held in River State. The Nigerian government says it has set up a panel to investigate a number of irregularities in the December 10th rerun election held in River State, Southern Nigeria. Among the issues to be probed is a leaked telephone conversation between the state governor, Nyesom Wiki, and electoral of officers discussing how to rig the polls. The police, in a statement, said that forensic experts from outside the country would assist the panel in its investigation. The panel, headed by a deputy commissioner of police, has 30 days to complete its investigations and make a public presentation of its findings. Now, the rerun elections held in River State was marred by electoral violence and murder of both civilians and security officials. The Nigerian government has approved a new policy to protect whistleblowers in the country. The policy developed by the Ministries of Finance and Justice was announced by the Minister of Finance, Kemi Adeoshun, at the end of the Federal Executive Council meeting held in Abuja. According to the new policy, at least 5% of any recovered loot will be awarded to the whistleblowers. What it does is it encourages anyone with information about a violation of government's financial regulations, mismanagement of public funds, and assets, fraud, financial malpractice, and other associated uh, conduct to report it. It covers disclosure of information leading to the return of Nigeria's stolen or concealed funds and assets. And it's intended to strengthen the mechanism for the fight against corruption, improve governance, and support the implementation of the Open Government Partnership. Um, the memo covered the scope of the policy, the manner in which uh, reports will be filed, which is uh, via a website, uh, by phone, or by um, email. It covered anonymity, protection of the whistleblower, which was very important, that whistleblowers will be protected against sanctions, um, and a reward scheme in the event that um, somebody who is a whistleblower actually either loses their job or is financially disadvantaged as a result of the information they have provided. Uh, we have a reward scheme which will pay no more than 5%, no more than 5%. So it, it's a scale um, according to um, <coughs> the, the seriousness of the, of the financial loss. Um, members, uh, of course, of FEC supported the policy wholeheartedly but made um, very strong suggestions around how we safeguard uh, public officers against malicious or false allegations and the policy covered this if information is provided that was deliberately false or misleading then that case must be handed over for investigation and possible prosecution to deter frivolous um, uh, reports but the really it's this is part of our fight against corruption our fight to strengthen institutional governance what we've discovered is that most financial crimes, people know about them, but they're scared to speak up. It is not possible to move money, for example, with just one signature. They're always two, but people are often scared to speak up. So the whistleblower policy actually gives them protection um, against um, the consequences of doing the right thing in the public interest and hopefully will allow, support us to recover a lot of concealed money um, by providing protection to those who provide us with the information. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, says it intends to embark on a comprehensive rehabilitation of the nation's three refineries located in Port Harcourt, Wari, and Kaduna states in the new year.
The cooperation says it is determined to move away from the approach of quick fixes and undertake a comprehensive revamp of the plants. Now, once the exercise is achieved, NMPC says the refineries in due course will draw up a chart for routine turnaround maintenance program as at when due. The United Nations has warned that Niger's commercial capital of Lagos faces an acute water crisis capable of creating unacceptable conditions for millions of people. According to the UN, the, the 21 million residents of Lagos struggle to find water suitable for drinking and sanitation. An independent expert appointed by the United Nations suggests that only 1 in 10 people have access to water provided by the state utility provider. Now, as a result of the public water system, many residents rely on private water supplies or bore pipe holes themselves. Damaged pipelines leak millions of gallons of treated water, about one quarter of the supplies meant for homes, schools, hospitals and the industry. The Nigerian government on Thursday formally launched the digital switchover in television broadcasting in the federal capital territory in Abuja. A rather colorful ceremony was held to mark the official migration from analog to digital broadcasting in the capital city. Representing President Muhammad Buhari was the Vice President Yemushi Bajio who remarked that the digitization exercise is the beginning of a very interesting time in the history of the country. More important are the doors opened by digital transition. First is that it will liberalize access to and increase the versatility of media information. Interactive programming, two-way data exchanges, mobile reception of video, internet and multimedia data will open up. The opportunities that this will provide are only limited by the imagination. Advertising, formal education, sales and marketing are obvious low-hanging fruits. Again, as, as I had mentioned in my speech to the National Assembly last Tuesday, that Nigerian artists and entrepreneurs in music, entertainment and filmmaking will be important pillars in our diversification plans. Digitalization will create jobs in the area of content and software development, provide platforms for film producers and musicians to release their productions directly to households. This would, of course, substantially cut off privacy, the piracy. Let me state for emphasis that this government is irreversibly committed to meeting the June 2017 deadline for the, for the switchover in the West African sub-region, and also to the rollout of, of the digital switchover in all the states of the Federation. The objective is not just to move customers and engineers from analog to digital in a simple technical sense, but to ensure a total overall of the whole TV watching experience and the economy around it. We are going as a government to forbid all forms of monopoly so that all Nigerians can get access to all types of content without having to expend money on multiple devices. Media pluralism is a cornerstone of democracy, and this fact should be reflected in the plurality of independent and autonomous media and in diversity of media content accessible to all. The Nigerian Army says it has rescued some 1,880 women and children from Boko Haram insurgents in the Sambisa forest. Major General Lucky Rabo, who is the theater commander of Operation Lafia Doli, said this at a news conference held in Maiduguri, northeast Nigeria. He says the troops also arrested about 504 Boko Haram terrorists, while 19 of them willingly surrendered to the Nigerian army. Nigeria has been battling Islamic sect Boko Haram for about seven years now. The sect no longer holds much territory in the country following intense attacks by the Nigerian army. Former Governor of Delta State James Ibori has regained freedom after serving out his term in the United Kingdom prison. Ibori was released on Wednesday following an order from a UK court. However, he will not be able to return to Nigeria until at least January next year as he has to report to the UK police once a week.
Iboi was sentenced to 13 years in prison by a UK court after pleading guilty to 10 charges of fraud and money laundering worth over £50 million in February 2012. The Nigerian Police Force has confirmed that the 10,000 successful applicants into the Nigerian Police will resume training on the 31st of December 2016. The trainings will take place in various police colleges and training schools across the Federation. 500 recruited cadet assistant superintendents of police will be trained for 12 months at the Police Staff College in Jos, while the 500 cadet inspectors will be trained at the Police College in Ikeja for, for their training, which will also last for 12 months. The 7,500 constables will be holding their trainings in police colleges located in their geopolitical zones. The trainings are expected to last for nine months. The Nigerian government has assured youths in the country of more job opportunities come 2017. This was part of what was discussed at the final edition of the federal government's town hall meeting held in Abuja. The meeting started in Lagos in April this year and has also been held in Kaduna, Kano, Uyo, Enugu and now in Abuja. It was introduced to bridge the communication gap between the government and the citizens of the country. This government is unrelenting in its efforts to ease the hardship in the land, especially using unemployment, brought about by years of poor or lack of planning, profligacy, mismanagement of funds, massive corruption, and lack of investment in social investment programs. We did not create to this hardship, but we are resolved to end it and make life more abundant for our people. There's no question about that. All we ask is your undiluted support. We have no doubt that working with you will achieve our set goals. As many of you are undoubtedly aware, 200,000 jobs were created in the first phase of the Empower Volunteers Program. This is perhaps the highest number of jobs that have been created in one fell swoop by any government in the history of our country. Some 300,000 jobs are next in line to bring the total to the promise of 500,000 jobs. These jobs benefit mostly the youths who will be engaged in the areas of education, health, and agriculture. What we try to do, or what we intend to do, is to make Nigeria's economy more resilient so that oil price doesn't hit us the way it has hit us. And what are the things that we need to do to do that? One, of course, we need to stop wastage of money to make sure that every, the little money we have is spent on the right things. And the things that will create jobs is largely infrastructure. And I know that my colleague will speak a lot about infrastructure, but let me explain why infrastructure is important. Currently, if there are two people in two different countries, let's say Vietnam and Nigeria, with the same talent, the one in Vietnam has an inbuilt advantage over the one in Nigeria, and the difference is infrastructure. It costs so much to do business in Nigeria. <coughs> it costs so much to transport goods. You have to run a generator. You have to have your own borehole. So even when people have creative ideas that create, could make jobs for themselves or for others, they are unable to take advantage. And in fact, we end up importing things which we could produce here. So once we sort out our infrastructure, We'll be able to create jobs for the future. This is the beginning of Nigeria's journey to disaster. What we are in now was going to come anyway. Whichever government was in power, because we've run out of cash. They've taken all our foreign exchange. Now I have, I have prime ministers flying in from foreign countries to meet me here, saying to me they don't like the idea that Nigeria is no longer importing stockfish. Why have we stopped? We are spoiling their economies. You go to Dubai, they are complaining the shops have closed because Nigerians are no longer shopping. All that wealth, the $22 billion, belongs to you. And I'm saying so because if you create these things and feed yourselves, the money circulates here. Imagine if every Nigerian was to eat only 500 naira worth of food per day times 200 million. And that money is circulating between you, the farmers, the processors, the marketers. 
Why should you complain of poverty? You will be among the richest young men anywhere in the world. Now we have a market here of close to 200 million. By the time the next census comes, we'll have the figures. You also have 100 million Nigerian Africans from West Africa, North, Central Africa, buying food in Nigeria now. By 2013, when privatization took place in November, we had run electricity as a government undertaking from beginning to end for 63 years. Now, in those 63 years, did everybody have a meter? Hello? So, we couldn't meter everybody as government in 63 years. We have now moved from government-owned to private managed power sector in three years. Is it out of context or within context to expect that what we, did, we could not do in 63 years, we would complete in three years? And I think that that is it. The point, therefore, to make is that the power sector in private hands is in transition. It's a three-year transition thus far. Um, we are doing a lot of things, and one of the things we are trying to ensure does not happen again is massive importation of meters. Because the more meters we import, the more jobs we take away. Niger's Ministry of Health has urged members of the public to be vigilant over a new outbreak of the deadly Lassa fever. Two health workers in Ogun State died of the fever earlier this week. The Health Minister Isaac Adewale urged Nigerians to be calm and seek care in healthcare facilities in the event they notice any symptom of the disease. The viral disease known as Lassa hemorrhagic fever has claimed many lives in the country. In 2015, 12 people died in Nigeria out of 375 infected, while in 2012 there were 1,723 cases and 1,012 deaths. Corruption not in my country. Eh, uh -huh. mm, I'm how work. Oh, correct, Oga. What is this that you are doing? Oga, they come on the part now, nah, make you go sell for. Oga, I correct Kuzabi this. Oga, titles and boys them. They do one. They will come out the original part, sell them, make plenty of kusa. No wonder why customers bring the uh, uh, generator back to our uh, workshop because they're bad. And not because of stuff. Not because they overuse the generator. Plus, say, never know they give them electricity. Before I open my eye, Makachuku, look at my talk in the heaven. Mm. Replace this original generator part back inside this generator of my customer. In short, before we do front jump. One, four jump. One, two, one. Stealing of generator parts or a changing of original parts to a fake one. That is corruption. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. The Nigerian Nara has fallen further to the dollar on the black market. The local currency was trading around 495 to the dollar on the black market on Thursday, compared to 485 per dollar recorded last week due to dollar shortages. Traders say the Nara could hit the 500 mark by next week as greenback scarcity persists and the Central Bank of Nigeria cuts supply to forex investors. Now, the Nara was quoted at 310 to the dollar on the official interbank window. Brutal change operators are now getting $8,000 each per week from TravelX against the usual $15,000 per week recorded last week. The Standard Organization of Nigeria has vowed to prosecute importers of fake and substandard goods into the country. Head of Inspection and Enforcement, Bid Obayi, was speaking in Lagos State, Southwest Nigeria. Obayi was taking newsmen around some products recently seized by the agency.
He says the agency will ensure it stamps out smuggling and reduce to the barest minimum the influx of substandard goods. Act number 14 of 2015 of Standards Organization of Nigeria has now given it enough prosecutorial powers. And that is why the new DG of SON, Mr. Anthony Abuluma, said under his watch, prosecution of these erring importers, it must be a priority. So that he will give examples with them and people will know that the act of SON 2015 is a good act that is out to protect Nigerians. And so Nigerians should abide by that. Please, if you have not seen it, get a copy of the Act number 14 of 2015 for Standards Organization of Nigeria. That is enough for you to understand what the DG is talking about. That son is out to say enough is enough and no more for economic sabotage. You want to do something, do it the way it's supposed to be. Go again, uh, in line with the standard so that the consumer will get value for his money. If I am buying 25 words, I know that I'm buying 25 words. If I'm buying 15 words, I will know. And I will now at a uh, uh, price according to the wattage of that product. But when you write 85 and somebody comes and you give him 85 words for just 15 words or 30 words, it is not acceptable. There is no hiding place for you who are engaged in these substandard products. And anywhere we see it, we will pick it. Whether it is here, Portacot or Medugri, anywhere we have any information about any substandard uh, product in this country, he is determined to make sure that the level of substandard products in circulation in Nigeria is reduced to the barest minimum. If possible, eradicate. Oil prices rose in quiet trading on Thursday, supported by strong U.S. economic data. A pause in the U.S. dollar rally and optimism that crude producers would abide by an agreement to limit output also helped prop up prices. Brent futures rose to $55.21 per barrel, while U.S. crude rose to $53.11 per barrel. Confidence that OPEC and non-OPEC oil producers would stick to a deal to cut output by almost 1.8 million barrels per day from January next year has helped support prices over the past few days. Human Rights Watch says security forces in the Democratic Republic of Congo killed at least 34 people during protests this week against President Joseph Kabila's refusal to step down from office. Congo's government, however, claims that 22 people were killed in the clashes, including a police officer, most of them by stray bullets or while looting. Opposition leaders say the delay is a ploy by Kabila to cling to power and ultimately change the constitution to run again for office. Kabila denies this but has de declined to commit to not changing the country's constitution. About 300 migrants have been saved from rubber and wooden boats in the Mediterranean Sea. Rescuers also recovered six dead bodies during the operations. This is according to the Italian Coast Guard. According to a statement issued by the body and the naval ships, it says that two privately owned tags rescued the people from four boats in the central Mediterranean. The death toll in the Mediterranean, the most dangerous border crossing on the planet for migrants, is estimated to be about 4,655 this year alone, which is about 1,000 more than in all of 2015. The Super Eagles of Nigeria has been ranked the eighth best team in Africa. The Eagles, however, dropped to 51, 51st position with 616 points in the latest FIFA World Ranking. The Nigerian Football Federation hasn't been involved in any football games since their latest victory against the Desert Foxes of Algeria at the 2018 FIFA World Cup qualifiers. The Eagles currently tap their qualifying group with six points, four points ahead of closest rivals, which is Cameroon, and five points ahead of Zambia and Algeria, who have one point each. Nigerian champions Enugu Rangers have been handed a tough draw in the preliminary round of the 2017 CAF Champions League as they will face JS Saura of Algeria. While Nigeria's other Champions League representatives, Rivers United, will face Mali's AS Real Bamako in the preliminary round. The preliminary round of matches of the CAF, and the Champions League and the Confederation Cup will be played between June, February 10th and 12th, 2017. 
South Africa Football Association has dismissed Ephraim Mashaba from coaching the country's Bafana Bafana squad after he was found guilty of misconduct. Safa Chief Executive Dennis Mumbo said the coach was guilty of the three charges leveled against him, which is gross misconduct, professional misconduct, gross insubordination, as well as violation of the Safa communications policy. He says the association is making plans to find a replacement for the team as soon as possible. Well, that's all we have on the news now. Thank you very much for watching. I am Thelma Okuru.